Next one, please, Nate. Did I say that Nate's flown all the way in from London? Yeah, especially for tonight. He's flying back straight after this. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> um, we, uh, so there's a, Oz DeFi Association sits under a venture studio called Not Centralized. Nick is wearing, if you want to stand up, Nick, and show your hoodie and the front. So Not Centralized is a venture studio that works on Web3 projects. Um, one of those projects is our own, which is this whole thing, which is Oz DeFi Association, now in five states. So we've got a member that is in Western Australia. She's just moved there. We've got a few members out of South Australia that are gonna stand up the first event. The east coast of Australia is covered. We are taking over, slowly but surely. But you know, it's all about bringing the grassroots together. So um, we got asked, as Not Centralized, to help out with the Sydney, the inaugural Sydney Web3 Summit. Watch this space as well, because there's gonna be some follow-up events from KPMG and Fishburners. They can fit 200 people in there. It's a great, I love this venue but that venue is just freaking huge. Um, and there was a great panels. Someone put up $10,000 worth of Bitcoin as a prize to 25 pitchers um, that, that pitched their Web3 ID. We had six semi-final, sorry, four semi-finalists on the night. It went down to a finals of two and there was one winner and he's not here today, but if you guys know Harrison Dell, um, he does crypto tax stuff. He's always on TikTok, but he won with his idea around um, uh, Juby, it's called Juby Dow, so J-U-B-I, you guys can look that up and uh, it looks pretty interesting. And the next one, before, yeah, I can, I can see it, people are getting sick of me, come on. <laughs> We're nearly there, folks. Um, so, upcoming events, this is the calendar. You can see it in table format or you can click at the top and you can go to the calendar view and you can flick through on the calendar. It's good on the phone, it's good on your desktop as well. But this is the um, Aussie Web3 calendar. Um, if you guys go on there and you see an event that we don't have, um, there's a coalition of the willing that has been pulling this together. And in fact, we inspired some of our fintech friends. Adam Keynes over at Ernst & Young has created a, wet, oh, sorry, a fintech calendar. And now there's people that want to create their other calendars like data-related events. Uh, data, sorry, not data. People might think it's dating, sorry. Data-related <laughs> events. Um, but yeah, you can see here, Blockchain Sydney has a whole heap. This is to the end of 2022, hello. Um, find a set, oh, you can sit up on the stairs, you can sit upstairs. Uh, everybody, Varun, Varun, hello, there we go. Come on in, come on in. We are gonna embarrass the people who come in late, just like comedians do. Uh, and then, yeah, anything that is missing, please do share it. Um, this is a community related thing. We built it together and we are gonna keep it and maintain it together, thank you. So uh, the next one, I think we get to the interviews. This is the exciting portion. So for this, we've got four interviews, everyone, and I'm gonna hand over, I think, to Leah first to conduct the interviews, uh, and we'll, yeah, here you go. Cool. Where is James from hey. Nifty? Come, come on up. Um, <laughs> Do we only have one, Mike? Yeah, That's fine. Cool. Okay, James, um, right, Nifty, um, so would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Nifty and what you do? We had a bit of a chat before, very interesting business, so very keen to get into it. G'day guys, I'm James Coombs. Um, Nifty is a private investment fund and what we're trying to, to do is produce Delta Neutral uh, returns and we've, we were founded in February last year and have successfully done the Delta Neutral <laughs> returns up until present day. So tell us a little bit more, sort of how is, it, how is it structured, what do you do, how does it work, it's, I, I understand it's a bit of a kind of like a managed investment fund type thing? Yep, yep, we have parallels to a managed fund, um, so what we do is we uh, collect money from everyday people. So I'm excited to say today that we're actually reopening for investment. Uh, we closed for investment in February. Uh, February, so we, yeah, we've just reopened. And it's similar to a managed fund in that um, you will invest your money and um, receive returns, but that's about the only parallel because 
Um, we, we don't speculate on any single asset. So one, one of the powerful things about investing in Web3 is you can produce a, a delta neutral re return um, through different investment vehicles, which we'll, we'll go into. Um, but yeah, the, the top line comment is that it's a zero speculation investment fund. So even during Q2 this year, when the market was down you know, 75%, and I'm sure there's a few people in here that felt that, um, the, the fund lost um, zero dollars. So how do you not lose money in this market? T talk us through that magic. Yeah, it, it, I totally get it. It can sound pretty crazy and it, it's always the first question I get when I'm talking to people about the idea. So what we do is, um, the, the, sorry, so the, the key to the product is that um, we can borrow the speculative assets. So by collecting funds from our investors, we can then use that as collateral and then use decentralized lending platforms like um, just a show of hands, who's familiar with something like Aave? Okay, so about half the room. So that, that's a platform where you can put up collateral in whatever asset you want to speculate on, which for us is uh, stable coins. And um, we can then borrow volatile assets. And so the people who have provided those assets for us to borrow are actually the ones wearing that delta risk. Uh, we can then take those volatile assets and provide liquidity or we can uh, use them in arbitrage situations or we can even stake them for a greater return than what we're paying the, the person lending us the asset. So you're basically providing the li liquidity, you are the liquidity provider using pairs of cryptocurrencies. You're facing off to a DEX essentially, that's how you operate. So yeah, I guess who is your customer? Talk us through uh, a little bit of that. I know you said everyday people, but everyday rich people, or how does it work? Yeah, can we, we just go to the next slide? So our customers are the people who invest in the orange and the blue lines. Um, so <laughs> what that's designed to represent is, as everybody would know over the last 12 months, um, so financial year that's just finished, um, traditional investment vehicles have, you know, had a pretty tough time. But what Web3 allows us to do is, um, like I was explaining, provide returns on the, uh, without speculating. So our customers, our, our typical customer is like sitting in this room today. We do have a investment minimum. So we, we try and stick to about, you know, minimum of 20K. And um, we like much prefer investment in USDC. So transferring the um, stable coin would be ideal, but we do have an on-ramp facility as well. So um, we, we've just reopened, so it's a really exciting to be able to do that. But um, yeah, our typical customers is people who don't like losing money. And I think you mentioned before you have a limit on how many people can actually invest, and in, um, I think that's 50, yeah. did you say? Yeah, great. Um, Okay, so uh, in terms of where to next and uh, what's your blue sky sort of thinking for, um, for Nifty? Yeah, so uh, the, the biggest risk for us is um, platform risk. So if we invest in a particular smart contract that's got you know, vulnerabilities or unforeseen risks, then uh, the, the fund loses that money, like will potentially could lose that money. And we mitigate that risk through um, looking, conducting our own audits, reading audits, and um, investing in you know, highly battle-tested platforms. So a, a sort of blue sky idea for us is to have our own DEX. So if we can, if we can crowdsource the liquidity for a DEX, then we remove a lot of that platform risk. Um, another risk for us is the impermanent loss risk, which is um, largely mitigated through strategies that I can go into detail with anybody who'd like to know after this. Um, but again, by providing our own decks, we, we virtually eliminate impermanent loss risk as well. Great, and how have you found sort of operating in this environment? Has the appetite died down? You said you opened up again, so I'm guessing there's actually, you know, people wanting to invest. How, how are you sort of, because you're not speculating on the underlying currency, you're creating liquidity essentially, and that's how you generate returns. So what have you 
um, found operating in this current market? What's the sentiment? Yeah, th this, well, in my experience, I've only been in the market, you know, coming up in two years. In my experience, the sentiment's the worst it's ever been. Um, in traditional investment, so all of our investors uh, are regularly on the phone to me asking, you know, is my money safe? I read about Bitcoin in the paper today. Um, so th the sentiment is, is, yeah, really bad, but in my opinion, that presents us a really enticing opportunity. Um, it's, it's also important to recognise that liquidity providing at the moment takes up the majority of the investment of the fund, but we also do um, arbitrage work. So, for example, um, when USDT broke its peg about a month or two ago, we are able to execute an arbitrage on that and that's probably made, you know, six months worth of returns in one go. So, it's important also to realise that even though there's platform and smart contract risk, there are ways around that that we're finding too. So. Um, traditional investors typically want to have a foot in the door in Web3. We're definitely finding that um, people are interested in the space, putting in a little bit more time than they were probably a few years ago. Uh, but there's definitely still a lot of fear out there. And um, I'm happy to try and put that to rest or talk about that. But there's definitely dangerous parts of Web3. And um, hopefully a fund like mine, and I'm sure many others will exist, can help you know bridge that knowledge gap. And, help people earn the Web3 returns that some of us do. Great. Um, so before we open up to questions, um, how do people find you? How can people get involved? Sort of talk us, talk us through that. What's the process? Yeah, so up until uh, right now, I've been super private, like the, the fund's been closed. Um, so the best way is just on LinkedIn. Like I'll just um, chat to you afterwards and we can talk about the investment process. But um, my surname's Coombs, as was on the screen before. Just jump on LinkedIn and um, send me a message. I'm always around for a lunch or coffee to try and discuss how it all works. Um, but yeah, for now, I won't dox myself and give you my Twitter handle because that's dangerous. An interesting point, again, we were chatting before this, there's no lock-up period. So normally with investment vehicles, there's always a lock-up period of whatever it might be, 90 days, whatever, there is no lock-up period because you want to encourage people to participate. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, Leah. Um, that's, <laughs> that's exactly right. Look, we're, we're trying to create the most compelling offer for investors. Um, so yeah, there is no lock-up period and there's also no management fee. So it's completely free to invest. And for the you know minds in the room that are ticking over, that means that um, the only money the fund makes is in excess of the return that we're paying out. So in a lot of ways, we're sharing the risk with the investors. And I think that's a, um, you know, th that's a trust building sort of way to do it. Cool. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions. Any questions for James? Yep. One over there. Um, quick question. Um, so when you say the fund makes uh, money in excess of the returns that you're paying out, is that like a fixed, uh, do you have a fixed contract as to how much percentage would go out to the investors or how does that work? <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, thanks for that, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, so it's an 8% fixed return. So we pay out 8% per annum and um, that's a compounded rate. So the default option is that it's just rolling in and, and compounding for investors. Um, and we're currently working on an index product as well. So it'll be an automatic uh, risk-weighted index product, um, which obviously involves a fair bit of speculation. So it's a completely different risk profile. But um, the product I've been talking about today is a fixed 8% and the fund keeps whatever's on top of that, minus some tax. Got one more. Hey James, thanks for that. Um, quick question, the $20,000 cap, is it because you're trying to stay under some regulatory hurdle or is it retail AFA settled or how is that, how are you working that in terms of compliance? I think it's a minimum, isn't it? Yeah, that's the price of admission. Um, so it's a 20K minimum normally. Like, look, if, if anyone's super eager to get involved for less than that, I'm, I'm more than happy to listen. If, if there's people that want to dip their toes and then commit to 20K down the road, then that's totally possible as well. 
Um, but yeah, we're, we're trying to just keep in that sort of, you know, approaching sophisticated style. And um, just for everyone's info, all investments are structured as a loan as well. So it's structured as a loan to the company and you, you receive the 8% fixed return. Yep, there is a regulatory piece, um, which is why they're structured as a loan presently. So that keeps us out of trouble mainly. Um, but to, yeah, to, to, without boring you, um, we've got to stay within that sort of 50 investor range for now. Cool. Is there anything online as well? Nope. Hey, um, do you have any offering that which is uh, um, completely on, on chain so that it doesn't require your clients in that space to spread their cheeks for KYC and all that sort of thing? It sounds like a weighted question. <laughs> um, that's a really interesting thought, and the the product mix, you know, w would uh, you know virtually overnight be able to be on chain as well. Um, but presently, we don't. No, pre presently we don't. But um, you know, if there's any developers in the house looking to spin up a um, a DAP that would do that, there's something I definitely look into, yeah? Thanks for the idea. Do we have time for one more or do we wrap it up? One more, last one. I, I feel like I saw, I saw a hand go up there. I might just go, last question. He will be here after. Sorry, last question. Um, so yeah, just curious about like, you know, risk management, all of that, because this sounds awesome. So like, say with a Terra and Luna and all of that, like, so were you invested in that? Did you survive coming through that? And just a quick follow-up with that, sorry. And just a quick follow-up, you said you made like about six months of returns on the USDT, like the Tether. Um, so if you had done that with um, Terra, like with Luna, would have you lost it then or? Uh, yeah, look, as, as a top line comment, no investments without risk, right? So I'm, I'm not sitting here pretending to have, you know, solved the world's oldest comment of, you know, free money. Um, however, with, with enough due diligence, um, you can avoid, like I truly believe, 99.9% .9 of the risk. Um, we were in UST and... Uh, War zero dollars of loss because the writing was on the wall for quite a long time for Anchor Protocol. And just to share, the moment we got out was when um, Do Kwon had to put in an extra $500 million to pay the, the yields out, right? So what does that say to the average investor? That it's not a sustainable pro protocol. Like one and one does make two in that example. So we um, got out as soon as a risk like that appeared. And to answer your second question about um, the arbitrage, the arbitrage product only holds over collateralized stable coins. So for DAI, for example, um, and it uh, would speculate on the, it was able to profit on the USDT losing peg because of the uh, immediate in and out transaction. So it was, it held USDT for less than half a second, yeah. Awesome, thank you so much. Round of applause. <laughs> Do we have Jake from D Hedge? Hello, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, welcome Jake. Thank so you. could we just start by a quick introduction about yourself and D Hedge and what, what you guys do? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, hi, everyone. And, and firstly, congratulations on the community. I was admiring the calendar that you had up at the start of the call, and it's action-packed here. You've got a head, so congratulations. Um, yeah, I'm Jake. I'm Head of Growth and Marketing at DHedge. Uh, DHedge, has anyone heard of DHedge before? Hands up. Great, awesome. Um, what about synthetics? Have you heard of synthetics too? Cool, okay. So the reason I bring those two up is because DHedge was the first protocol built on synthetics back in 2020, mid-2020, mid so about two years old. Um, fully decentralized, 
non-custodial, is that better? Yeah. Fully decentralized, non-custodial asset management platform on mainnet, Ethereum, Polygon, and Optimism. Which means that we uh, set up an asset management space where you can set up your own fund and run it, and you can also invest in other people's funds. Um, yeah. Cool. And um, how did it come about? Sort of what what drove the idea to, I guess, come about? Synthetics has been for around for a couple of years. So yeah, talk us through. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So there was three founders: um, Erman Jurovich, Radek Ostrowski, and Henrik. Uh, so it's Henrik Anderson, who's um, the CIO at Apollo Capital in Melbourne. And the Synthetics protocol, when it developed, the synths that it created, so synthetic assets on chain, gave the opportunity to manage funds in a very decentralized way safely so that it's non-custodial. So if you're an investor, you can allocate your assets to a pool that can be managed, but you always have access to pull them out. And so the synthetic assets that were created enable this opportunity. So in the two years since, we've developed the protocol out, but that was the concept of it. That was it where, it, where it began. Um, and is DHedge operating as a DAO, is that correct? Yeah. yeah, so I think Synthetics is now fully decentralized in, you know, as decentralized as you can be. I think I heard Kane talk about it at the AFR Crypto Summit. So um, with DHedge, um, could you talk us a little bit a little bit about how what it's like to run it as a DAO? What are some of the positives? What are some of the negatives that you're seeing? Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so as a DAO, um, DHedge has a, a token, the DHT token. Uh, and primarily we use that token for governance. So of the three and a half thousand token holders on, on mainnet, they can participate in the development of the protocol. So whenever we put a new integration proposal up or something to develop the protocol, then we go through the typical governance processes like a forum proposal, which then goes to snapshot so that people can vote something in or vote it out. Um, and again, very heavily community oriented. So we operate all the typical community infrastructure like discords and community calls and active social media and things like that. Um, but the DHT token we also use to incentivize good investing behavior by uh, offering rewards for people invested in pools that are doing well. So you get an extra incentive for being in positively yielding pools. Um, and yeah, so and you can also stake the DHT token to earn extra incentives for participating. I'm going off off script here, but how uh, one of the problems with DAOs is um, sort of participation in terms of voting. How are you finding that uh, sort of in terms of not, not percentages, but yeah, um, do you find your members participate quite actively? Yeah, I think um, I think I mean just reflecting on James's comments in the in the previous interview, like through the bear market. Uh, engagement fell, obviously, because as a lot of liquidity came out of the ecosystem, there was less motivation to participate. But we still see a high rate of participation in voting, um, and Discord ticks over quite frequently. So there's still active community, and we see it through the investors. So there's, I think I mentioned 1,500 pools created in the last two years by over 1,000 managers. And, and of those managers, there's been about $1.5 million in fees generated for the managers operating those pools. So there's a, a strong engagement history that we're looking to keep building out, and um, I think our product development is showing that. Great, um, and same as for James, the same question about operating in sort of a bear market. What's the, uh, you partly answered that already, but what's the sentiment, what's the general outlook, sort of, yeah, how are you, how are you thinking about the current state of, the state of play? Yeah, sure, it's a good question. I think um, we took the opportunity to really focus on the product and develop a whole new protocol built on top of DHedge. So that's what the Tauros um, column is on the screen at the moment. A uh, Tauros is a, where, where DHedge is an active management platform, being that if you are a manager, you're manually actively managing your asset allocation using these integrations on the screen. Any of those integrations? Well, Lyra is still coming, but it's past governance. Um, Tauros is the opposite. The Tauros is fully automated. So we have automated strategies that you can invest in and or you can buy the token for and have a strong expectation of what that strategy is going to do. So as an example, again, just to reflect on James's comments before, we're launching a delta neutral hedge strategy tomorrow on Tauros, which will, will 
follow a typical delta neutral strategy, which if anyone's interested, we can go through after, after the interview. Um, but yeah, that protocol is growing really quickly. And so we thought that it was a good complement to the existing product offering. And it was really great to focus on that through the bear market. Okay, thank you. And in terms of next steps, priorities, what are you looking towards? Obviously, Taurus is, is new and that's just um, come out. Anything else that you wanted to share with us? Are you growing the community or raising funds? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, always looking at improving the D-Hedge offering. So uh, we're, we're about to launch well, a new strategy tomorrow, so the Delta Neutral Hedge strategy. Uh, and then there's a Lyra integration uh, which will be coming out soon, TM. Um, and so, so the, that'll give the hedge managers the op opportunity to manage with options in addition to the remaining, uh, what are they? So you've got uh, lending, spot trading, options, liquidity providing, leverage, like the full suite of DeFi applications you can do within a D-Hedge managed fund. So it's quite dynamic and um, options are the next thing to bring. And then after that, we'll probably look at bringing in the Quenta Futures um, product after that, so so a strong roadmap ahead. And how do people find you? How do they get involved? Sort of where to? Yeah, so the, the websites are on the on the screen. There's uh, dhedge.org or toros.finance. Uh, Discord links are on those sites. Uh, Twitter accounts, etc. Um, and yeah, the Discord's on, ongoing all the time. So more the more the merrier. Come in and create your own fund. You can set up a fund on dhedge yourself. No KYC, full decentralized, no, <laughs> no, no minimum investment. Anyone can get involved. So it, it's uh, it's great. There's no, <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah, that's up to you. Uh, well, that's 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 off chain. We're we're <laughs> we're, we're only focused on on chain as a yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Any questions? Test, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, quick question. So obviously your focus EVM, ETH, Mainnet, Polygon, Optimism. A, any plans to roll out to other EVM compatible chains, AVAX in particular? Uh, institutions are loving that to high hilt uh, and Phantom. So any, any possibilities to roll out to other EVMs? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, we, the roadmap was, uh, we, we launched on Polygon about 12 months ago, August 2021, and then got to Optimism December 2021. And so since then, we've been really focused on the product development. Uh, the decision to go to Optimism was like 50-50 Arbitrum or Optimism, and Optimism won out that vote. Um, but at the moment, we're not considering any other L2s or, uh, or competing L1s. Uh, the main reason is because we've built this sort of integration ecosystem that we're focusing on and trying to keep close to that for the time being and also probably the relationship with synthetics is very sort of close to the product development and so synthetics is only on optimism and mainnet so that's sort of the the, the decisions driving that that um, product decision hey mate thanks uh, I'm interested in the custody piece. So when somebody uh, invests in a fund that's hosted on DH, uh, does the fund manager, is that the right term, right? Um, do they then receive the money and then move it however they wish? Or can you just explain the custody to us? Yeah, that, that's probably one of the key benefits of this platform is that it's entirely non-custodial. So the way the contracts are set up is you as a user commit assets to a contract that the manager operates that asset allocation. So you at all times can pull assets out of that contract and the contract is where the custody occurs. So the manager doesn't own it, the investor doesn't own it, it's locked up in a contract. Um, manager can't pull your funds out. So the manager can just move them, but they can never withdraw them. So you always retain control of your assets. We've got one more. Yeah. Um, sorry, I know you can't see me, but the question is, how does your how does 
your product compared to Enzyme? Yeah, good question. Enzyme's probably a direct competitor of DH. Uh, Enzyme, I think, is on a different... I think we're both on Polygon and Mainnet, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but yeah, very similar offering. I think Enzyme has moved a little bit more into the index side of things and offering sort of uh, managed indices. Whereas, um, but again, there's a, there's a lot of product overlap. So it, it's a good comparison to Enzyme as a similar protocol. Awesome, thank you. Um, round of applause. Yeah, oh, do we have one more? Sorry, all good? Okay, after. Um, over to Katarina. Uh, thank you very much, Leah. You guys are going to see Leah back on stage a little bit later talking about NFT NYC. So that's going to be awesome. Um, and now we've got Kat Katarina. And who's first up? If we can actually switch over the slides. OSL. OSL. Come have a seat. Choose one, <laughs> two, three. <laughs> Okay, all right, just get these. So welcome, uh, Mark. Um, so Mark's from OSL, and I was just uh, just sp uh, speaking to him earlier about how long he's been around, how it started. So we're just a quick introduction. We know you've been uh, started about 10 years ago. You're based in Hong Kong, or OSL is based in Hong Kong, head office in Hong Kong worldwide, but um, also, they are headed up by Aussies, bringing the Aussie DNA into it all. So that really intrigued me as well. Um, and then we'll get probably, oh no, we haven't come up yet. So we'll just, um, with about 250 people worldwide, pretty huge, um, but basically more into the in regulated institution, did I get that right? Regulated institutions, um, and here to really get on to the B2B side. So it's getting into institutions, really concentrating on that. We know that's what we, we want, or some, most of us you know, want that, some, some do, um, that helps adoption. So I will bring it over to you. Um, I think, yeah, this first question, I think Mark reduced it a little bit. I think it was quite a long one, was it? <laughs> so what is OSL's view on the market? Um, dislocation and how does it protect itself and shareholders? Awesome. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for having us tonight. Um, yeah, as Katarina? Katarina? There you go. Got it right. Said. So, yeah, we're uh, a regulated um, digital asset firm. Our sort of DNA, as Katarina said, is to be a regulated firm, operate in a regulated environment and face regulated counterparts. So that's kind of what our founders have had since day one. And we're sort of Everything we do is around that, so that's a big part of our ethos. So, you know, um, in terms of the recent dislocations and how you protect yourselves, I think a lot of that stuff goes back to um, some of the best practices that have come from traditional finance, so risk management, KYC, you know, the very basics, and, and that's what you've seen, I think, come through the last couple of weeks and months in crypto. Um, a lot of, <clears throat> you see these centralized lending pr platforms have, have contagion because of the terror fallout, You've seen funds go under. A lot of this stuff, I think, we, we think could be avoided be due to just best practices in how you run your business. Um, so I think this sort of washout you've seen the last couple of weeks is kind of a bit of a changing of the guard. And, and we're hoping like sort of more grown up sort of firms are gonna start to emerge like us and hopefully you can you know, profit from the future and into the next cycle. Um, how do we do that? So it's just been super, 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 super conservative about everything we do. So we're regulated in Hong Kong. Um, we're the first firm globally to get regulated by the SFC for um, type one, type seven activities, which is like basically securities dealing um, for virtual assets. And um, so the sort of the rigor that we're held to is the same as like a Goldman's or a JP in Hong Kong. And we're grandfathered in Singapore of our licensing under the PSA. So we're listed in Hong Kong as well on the stock exchange, main board stock exchange. So all the governance that comes with that sort of filters through into our business. So as I said, very conservative, big focus on risk management, compliance, KYC, regulation, etc. Thank you. Um, now with the recent trends that we sort of have been seeing um, play out in the, what are playing out in, uh, in the space at the moment, what are you seeing playing out in the institutional investment space? Thanks. Um, is it awkward with the mic? Um, no, so I think you've seen a retail flush out 
uh, you know, of seeing what's happening with the, the markets. What we're seeing on the institutional side and the conversations that we're having is they're moving forward um, unabated. So banks, big regulated banks globally, brokers, um, funds management companies, CFD providers, fintechs, they're all trying to build the pipeline, uh, the pipes, sorry, the pipes and the infrastructure to be able to deliver this asset class to their clients over the coming years. So that we've seen, that hasn't stopped in a, in, in a they haven't even flinched. So that's been really encouraging. Now, being quite at the forefront of, um, of industry, um, how do you think about the investment standards and, ins and ensuring OSL is accountable to their shareholders uh, when the industry is still in its infancy? Because we're really quite young still. Yeah, sure. So I think, as, as, as we all know, crypto as an asset class is pretty young. It's probably the first new asset class we've seen in 50 or 100 years or more so. So there's going to be bumps along the road. There's going to be projects that fail, then, the, you know, these people are trying to, the builders, the devs, they're trying to do cool stuff. They're trying to change, you know, change the way, change the financial plumbing, make things more democratic, all that kind of stuff. So we love all that. Um, I think they can still, if you're new to the space, there's still investor protection parts of that. And that's what I think the, the regulators are going after. Um, you know, for us, it's just maintaining, we run a really tight ship. We run a well-run business. A lot of those focuses on compliance, as I said, regulatory stuff, KYC, um, running a really, you know, really like grown-up business, and that's and that's what we do. How we, and so that's how we, you know, our investors or our investors, our shareholders, our clients, they all appreciate this about us. Um, you know, we want to be the adults in the room, and that's why they trade with us. Um, and with the regulatory uncertainty um, around digital assets, uh, it seems to be a key barrier in adopting, um, in having uh, adoption. Um, what do you think, what's your view on regulation uh, within the industry and how do you see the framework progressing? Yeah, sure. Um, I think regulation is going to be needed to get mass adoption in its asset class. I really do. Um, and then also, the institutional money to you know to deploy capital, new capital, fresh capital, they need to have a regu they need to be regulatory clarity. And it's great. Australia's got a consultation paper with the Treasury. That's really a positive step. But until that's law, no super fund or no big fund is going to deploy capital here, uh, not just here in Australia but globally. So I think the you know, everyone's going to look to the US. Everyone's going to look to what the SEC are doing. Um, I think that's going to be like the barometer for the rest of the world to how they form their regulatory you know, stance. Different parts of the world have gone in different stages. So you see UK doing some stuff, Hong Kong, Singapore, etc. But we really need this clarity and on a global scale, like some sort of coordination. Otherwise, it's going to be a bit too fragmented for these big global um, you know, real monies to invest in the space. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, we might open it up to the audience now. Any questions? online or in here on regulation in the space or what OSL are up to? No? Anything online? Oh, yes. Um, on the regulatory side, a few people asking, what do you see as the biggest risk for your business model from, from the regulatory side? I know it's murky, but... I think two biggest risks for like a company like us. Um, one is the time to ratify and make it law. If this just goes on for five years and just and kind of operate in this grey, it's going to be really hard for people to come to market in a meaningful way. So I think that sort of time to make things law is one. And then maybe also the sort of a lesser extent shoehorn in existing or shoehorn in digital assets into existing regulatory frameworks. I think that's just going to be not ideal. I think a clean slate is probably the best way to go forward. Can't see up there. Anyone upstairs or in the audience? Another online. The crowd in real life is terrible. Like, what are you guys doing? Online's killing it. Um, Axel, brother, who's got a super, super impressive collection of hats behind him. You can't see, but he's online. Oh, good, he's smiling now. Yes, bro, I can see your hats. Um, time frames, like what, what sort of, uh, no, he's turned his camera off now. Um, so you mentioned some of the regulatory hurdles. W guesstimate, time frames, obviously got a new Labour government. Do you guys have an advocacy channel 
up to policymakers if there was an amazing Web3 venture studio that was also a consulting arm that could help you, would you have use of that? And it's not a loaded question at all. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so we, we submitted to the most recent consultation paper to the Treasury, and we consulted to the one last year. Um, as you all know, like governments take a long time to do stuff, uh, especially when it involves investors and large sums of money and leading edge technology, right? So. Uh, I would be, and this is my opinion, not ourselves, do not, you know, um, I, I think we're going to be best case a year away from getting anything. Realistically, it's going to be 18 months to two years to getting anything passed in law that's going to be viable down here. Um, I say the consultation paper has been great, but that needs to go through the Senate. That needs to be reviewed by different lawyers and people and stakeholders and stuff. So I think it's going to take a while. And when you just mentioned the Labour government, you know, no one's really got a good handle on what their view on this is. So, you know, I think everyone's broadly supportive, but the reality is these things do take a bit of time. So I wouldn't be holding your breath for that to be law. I think that's probably the best way to put it. Anyone? No? I do have one. What is, what about the everyday person? What about us? You're, you're with the institutions, you're B2B. Um, what about the everyday person? What do we do to help regulation come along? What do, Are we, you know, holding up, what's his name, Senator Andrew Braggs or something like that? Are we pushing things through? Who, what do we do as everyday people? Yes, yeah, good question. I think, you know, ultimately um, governments, policymakers, all these kind of guys are going to listen when, when the public speaks up. At the moment, you see crypto volumes globally are down across the board, right? So at the moment, there's not real going to be a big push or groundswell for all this stuff. Um, if these ETFs got passed, not just here, but in the US, there was big volume. You know, people are making money and making hay and it's all you know, you know, really going well. That, that's a good thing. I think from a personal perspective, the best thing you can do is just look after yourself because I think the regulators are really care about investor protection. So as some of the guys mentioned earlier about UST and all that stuff, like just be really mindful. Every, you know, never invest more than you can afford to lose. I think the more people that get rugged uh, and publicly rugged, um, that's gonna, might speed things up, but it's also going to cast like a bit of a, a bad light on the industry, and it's already got enough issues as it is. So, being super diligent in how you deploy your capital, I think, is really important. And you know, doing your due diligence, KYC, knowing the protocols, who's the when you're in discords, just not jumping into everything, uh, that kind of thing. I think that that's the stuff you can do personally to safeguard yourself. On the, the big end or the big end of town, I think you just got to let it work through the system. Well, thank you. Um, and I think we're good. Wrap it up. Thank you very much, Mark. Okay. Oh, okay. We'll have you come up. Okay. All right. Um, now, we do you want to introduce... You all right? Oh, God, no, I just take over. I always tend to take over everything. I'm sorry. <laughs> So we've got uh, Danny Tower from uh, Coinly here. I don't know if you guys know about Coinly, um, where it's... I'm going to let you in, tell it better. I'm probably um, a little bit more articulate than I am on it. But uh, just so everyone knows, I'm actually a customer of yours as well. So um, just to put that out there. But here, tell us about it. Thanks for that. Uh, it's great to hear people are actually using Coinly. Uh, so... So what is Coinly? I think some of you in the room and online will be familiar, but we're effectively two things. One is a portfolio tracking solution when it comes to crypto and digital assets. And another one, which particularly in Australia we'll be hearing about a lot, is the tax report and tax reporting solution. Um, Coinly basically connects up with all your wallets, chains, um, exchanges, and effectively can read your transactions, can, can't trade on your behalf, can read um, through APIs or you upload CSV files um, to then track your report or generate um, a tax report, track your portfolio or, or a tax report basically. Um, so yeah, it's effectively meant to save a lot of the time that goes into tracking portfolios and also calculating your taxes. We generally find people that use Coinly have multiple integrations, connections to exchanges, and it's really different with how people are actually interacting with traditional finance because often people might have you know, one bank account that they have their salary paid into, they might have their savings account, 
mortgage, car loan, everything in one place. It's convenient. Generally, you know, Combank is probably not going to go bust anytime soon. So, you know, it, I think self-custody is such a big thing in the crypto world. I, you know, I'm a big advocate for self-custody. But what it means is people are holding crypto in different places and we're basically bringing everything together. Not that I'm going to be chilling, but yeah, I've got a heap of wallets out there. But anyway, that made it a lot easier. Um, just what is your overview? Now, it is tax time. It is hard. We've got to go and try and figure out where all our money is and how much we made, lost, we, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, to the tax office, we lost. Okay. But what's your overview of the guidance, the ATO guidance for crypto assets? Yeah, sure. So without boring everyone with tax rules and tax legislation, basically, if you're an investor and you have crypto, you're likely going to have to pay capital gains on crypto. And it's actually amazing how many people think they can hide their taxes with crypto. Everything's on chain. So really not a good place to hide. Um, and the ATO are definitely upskilling themselves in this area. Um, there's a lot more data reporting that needs to be done now with exchanges so that effectively when you provide your ID onto exchanges, um, the ATO can see uh, a lot of information that they're required to provide. And also um, y you effectively get that matched against what you report in your taxes. So as an investor, you generally have to pay capital gains tax. If you've made money from when you purchased it, you probably have to pay some tax. But if you've lost money, and a lot of people are probably in this position, I know I might be, um, then you know, there is a silver lining where you can generally offset losses against future gains. Um, and that's one that people generally miss. So using software or you know, however you want to track your crypto portfolio or records when it comes to tax time, be aware that if you do have losses, there is a silver lining there. You can potentially offset that against gains. If you haven't made any gains this year, maybe in future years. And um, going on to the next question, any common misconceptions that comes to mind regarding crypto and tax? Yeah, so I think we've busted one myth that crypto is definitely taxable. Um, I, think, I think a lot of people think that they can spend, you know, I think crypto cards are very common now. And I'm seeing it more and more where people are just you know, going to stores, tapping away at shops for their groceries and coffee. And people think, yeah, I don't have to pay tax on this. It's, you know, um, and there's this rule out there called the personal use asset rule, which under $10,000, don't have to worry. But that's generally not the case. So every time you do go and buy that coffee, you're likely creating a taxable event. Um, can be really hard to track as well, um, unless you kind of trawl through statements. Um, so that's probably, pr probably another big one out there as well. Um, and yeah, I think just, I think the big one, you know, I think hearing the interview before around regulation and what we can do, obviously tax is one of the first things that comes up um, from government as a, you know, especially if people are making a lot of gains, you know, government get very interested um, with tax. I think recording and paying taxes is one thing we can all do to, you know, help sensible regulation form in the future. Um, I think that it's, it, it's on the responsibility is on us as you know, crypto holders or being part of the crypto ecosystem, um, and you know, with self custody comes responsibility on that as well. So, yeah, I think um, I think that can also really help drive um, sensible regulation. And um, so, as I said before, it is tax time. What do you have any top tips for us ahead of? the next season? Yeah, sure. So a few, few ones. I think one, firstly, is a bit more general, is just having really good wallet hygiene. You know, having separate wallets for different transactions is always a good idea. And so if you ever get asked um, you know, by the ATO to produce records or transactions, having separate activities in different wallets is going to really help. You might have an NFT trading wallet. You might have a wallet where you store the NFTs. Um, yeah, so having, having that is going to be important. Another one is just remembering that if you hold your asset for more than 12 months, you might get a CGT discount of 
So if you do have, you know, if you've held, for example, Bitcoin, um, and you've decided to sell it after that 12 month period, you'll get that 50% reduction. Um, again, at the moment I mentioned earlier, if you've got losses and you've effectively realized those losses, so if you've sold at a loss, um, you'll generally be able to offset that as an investor against any future gains. So that's really important to remember. Um, and again, you know, be able to track track these things. It, it, it's one thing to just report a number in a tax return, but if you don't have the records that back it up, you know, the ATO may come and ask and you will have to produce it. So also having really good records is important. Um, the other one I'd say is if you are into complex DeFi or NFTs and, you know, heard some, probably some more complex interaction of how you can trade crypto today. But definitely go and see an accountant. Go and use an accountant that understands crypto. Um, you know, software is great. It will only take you so far in terms of collating your records. Um, but definitely see an accountant um, who can actually understand how you're transacting, what your intentions are, um, and, and yeah, go from there. Thank you. I know I have a few questions, but um, we, yep, we'll just come over here. We'll open it up now. Uh, hello. Yeah. Um, we had some uh, clients, sometimes uh, they had the actually offshore structure in BVI, Cayman, and Singapore, something like that. But basically, they found the property, uh, they centralized, not they probably actually the decision maker in Australia. So what's your thinking and how to use the offshore structure to reduce the tax or something like that? Probably I think this really practical uh, question or issue for a lot of founders in Australia. I know um, in the past probably Australian doesn't use offshore structure that much, but I know Web3, many people prefer to do so and what's your opinion on, on that? Thank you. This is a spicy one. <laughs> so firstly, if you're using offshore structures, be well aware that if you're operating in Australia, you are likely going to have a tax obligation here. Um, and so first and foremost, see an accountant um, if you are using offshore structures. Um, yeah, I think it comes down to being responsible in the jurisdiction which you're operating, right? If you're operating everything out of Australia, but you're wanting to have everything offshore, there's probably an issue there with, you know, how the company is being structured, et cetera. Um, but yeah, generally with those ones, um, make sure your ducks are in a row, see an accountant, um, get proper financial advice, hashtag not a financial advisor. Um, and yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really know what else to say apart from please do get professional help on that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, anyone else here? Have we got any online? <laughs> well, whilst that's happening, I might just ask. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, probably in a similar boat to you. You know, how many? How what, is there a cap on the losses you can roll, <laughs> and what? And how? And for how many years? Yeah. So, I don't think there's a cap. If you've genuinely made those losses, you can claim them. You you do have to actually have made the losses. Um, so, but, <laughs> um, and by by that I mean you actually have to have sold in that tax year. So. Um, you know, if you're still holding the asset, you haven't realized it. You have to crystallize it. Um, so you can generally hold those losses until you make enough gains to kind of use them in future periods. Um, and obviously, you know, your prior tax returns, you can kind of make sure you claim your losses all in each period. Uh, but yeah, that's generally how it works. So. Sorry, I'm asking a lot of questions, but could you give us, if you go through a lot of accountants, right, some of them are, are very good at certain areas and not so great in other areas, could you give us three or four tips as to how to identify uh, a tax accountant who knows the space and isn't just selling us their product?
Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd probably say be wary of anything you see on TikTok or Discord oh. first. <laughs> um, but I would, I would generally have, a, have that initial chat with them and explain, you know, what are you, what are you doing in the crypto space? Try and suss out whether they understand the protocols you're using. You know, if you're involved in DeFi, are they aware of the, you know, different protocols out there and how you're looking to trade? And you know, you might be might be trading as a hobby. Personally, when I got into crypto, I just wanted to understand wh how what a decentralized wallet looks like or a wallet. You know, how does all these concepts look um, online? So try and try and work with the accountant to understand whether they you know, gauge whether they know what they're talking about. Um, generally, there are quite a few accountants out there that kind of advertise online, and they have you know extensive crypto support. And so I, I would say, don't just go straight to the first accountant you see. Try and kind of you know get get a few quotes. Try and meet with them. Explain your situation, especially if you're really into the space. It's definitely worth partnering with someone that that understands um, what you're doing. Maybe they're even involved in it themselves as well. Thank you. How are we going for time? Uh, one more question from the way. Yeah? Um, actually, that's, that's okay. Say it, say it on there. Oh. All right. I'll, I'll ask it. Oh, Nick, Nick will. Genuine online question. Um, would they be a registered tax agent or just an accountant? And is there a difference? Uh, naive question, but I generally don't know. Yeah, there is a difference. So in Australia, the tax profession is regulated and people that can sign off tax returns are generally referred to as tax agents. And so um, most accountants that you go to for tax purposes will be registered um, and as a tax agent, um, you, know, you can always check that with them, uh, but it's a regulated industry. So you, not anyone can just go and sign off your tax returns. That's it. Um, all right. So just to thank you very much. But just to finish off, there are, um, if you want to see the guys at Coinly um, after this, they might help you out with a couple of little, um, little, what are we calling them, ways to get you started on your journey with Coinly and help you out a little bit more there. So have a chat to them. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much. <laughs> Katrina, everybody, um, if you guys don't know, if, do, do, who, hands up here who goes on Twitter Spaces. Hands up. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a good number. So every Tuesday, I believe it is, if you're interested in all things investing, there's a trio of awesome women. Uh, Katarina is one of them. Jess, Amir, and Paola, I forget her last name. Oh, sorry? Ro Rojas. Um, and every Tuesday, seven... 7 o'clock on Twitter Spaces, uh, Bulls, Bears and Babes, so check that out. Speaking of Spaces, we do ours every Monday around 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, just depending on when our Tarot and I have meetings. It is all the world of revolving around us, I apologise, but uh, it's, yeah, it's completely central, uh, yeah, whatever, whatever he said. So um, uh, thank you very much to all the speakers. We've got a few announcements coming up. If we can go to the next slide, please, Nick. Uh, Nick is, you know, pretty good at the slides and stuff, except when he's not. Um, tr sorry, it's his first day. Uh, but yeah, I, I think the tax thing is really interesting, right? Like, I think a lot, I wonder how many people are just doing their own tax and not wanting to take it to an accountant because they're too embarrassed to show that they bought cum rocket. <laughs> so there might be people that, you know, I think m p p part... <laughs> The utility is there, Nick, I know, just like Doge and Shiba, but you know, part of it might be the embarrassment. So I think maybe part of the messaging, the, it's okay, whatever token you bought, we don't care the name. It's all about utility, except when it's not. Um, so there's a few other things that we've got. We've got three kind of announcements. The first one up is going to be, uh, actually, we'll go, to, we'll go to Collective Shift after, sorry. I've got these in the wrong order, my bad. I know, blame Mark. Um, Leah Deshkina, please come up on stage. Have a seat. The roles have reversed. We're going to get Leah to talk about, I'm probably not going to have you, just, just um, if you, do you want to bring anyone else up on stage whilst they're here? Jake, Denny, come on down. 
Uh, can we see them on camera? Chris, are we okay positioned as they are? Or do we, yep, good. I got the thumbs up from Chris. Chris is good. Please tell us all about NFT NYC. Cool. Um, yeah, Jake actually has done all of the um, events starting with Permissionless. So there was a bunch of conferences happening earlier this year, started off with Permissionless. Then we, uh, there was VCon for NFTs, those who are holding NFTs for Gary V. Um, then people moved to Consensus, which was in Austin. And then we um, ended up in NFT NYC in New York. Um, so I can probably speak, I probably have a slightly different view of it, but um, I can speak to the NFT stuff and you can then kind of fill in the gaps and, and tell us what your experience was. But from my end, I think the feedback, I only went to New York, but I kind of gathered the feedback around. And it seems that um, VCon, which was Gary V's conference, was probably the first of the conferences for NFT projects. Um, there will be more coming. Um, I know that Kevin Rose is organizing one next year, but that seemed to have really, really good feedback with um, people sort of speaking very positively about the curation element. It was highly curated. Um, it was very easy to navigate. It was in a stadium. So the feedback has been great. Um, so that kind of set the bar quite high. Um, I think then uh, consensus was a little bit of everything. It was quite NFT heavy this year, which is great. Um, but I think there was uh, an element of curation, but there, there was also an element of uh, free for all as well there. Um, and then we ended up in New York. From my perspective in New York, I think it was a bit of a zoo. There was 2,000 speakers, 15,000 attendees, seven venues, um, and there was, I think there was no curation at all. I don't know if you felt similarly. It was a bit of a pay to play, so a lot of people got to speak. Um, it was very difficult to navigate from my end. I think there was different streams where there was social, film, music, sport, whatever, NFTs, um, and people were darting around. Some of the venues were half empty, but from my end, the positives were that it was really good energy. People were still very enthusiastic about the space. Uh, it was you know, in the middle of Manhattan in Times Square. A lot of it was happening. There were great satellite events. Um, so would be keen to hear your, your perspective as well. Yeah, it was an interesting year. I've been going to crypto conferences in the US for about last six years. And in like 20, late 2017, 2018, it was all the law firms hosting events and it was all about ICOs and whether, or whether they're not securities and things like that. Fast forward to sort of this year and, and it's very different because there's applications, people are using them, it's DeFi's, NFTs, things like that. So I think it was interesting. We, we sort of started the team, uh, ETH Denver actually, um, in February, which was, which was exciting because it was really about sort of building, uh, but it turns out they kind of messed up the whole hackathon thing. So hopefully they fix that for next year, but heavily oversubscribed in the South, uh, Southwest, which was, they were touting it as being year of the NFT. Um, a lot of people talking about NFTs and not really knowing much about it. I think we counted about 54 panels through South by Southwest just this year, covering the topic with very few people you would recognize from the space. Um, so that was kind of telling, but South by Southwest do an incredible event and we're fortunate to have that coming here next year. So that's exciting. Uh, when we sort of rolled forward, Permissionless was incredible. So Blockworks, uh, the media publication that have sort of two areas of focus, one is sort of on macro and the other is on crypto, they produced an incredible event. I think the feedback generally there was absolutely incredible in terms of the level of production. And it happened to coincide perfectly with the downfall of, uh, of, of Lunar and Terra. Um, so that was, yeah, a very humbling part of the event. Um, so it certainly sort of stilled the air a little. Um, but some great Aussie companies that were there representing. Um, so that was really exciting. Uh, really from the sort of main event track from there, yeah, it was consensus in Austin. And so consensus has historically been in New York, taking over New York and typically happens later in the year. They brought it forward, took it to Austin because it's a slightly easier city to navigate. I think the problem with that was Coindesk perhaps have not kept to the bleeding edge of where things have evolved in terms of new DeFi, pure DeFi protocols and NFTs. It still felt like they were reporting on yesteryear. So still heavily uh, alt L1 strategy positioning, old school conference in the conference center um, and not the sort of typical sort of con um, conference levels. At the same time, we had three hours capital blowing up. So at that time, that probably didn't help. And then that sort of rolled into uh, 
uh, NFT NYC. And I think the thing about NFT NYC that I, I don't think we probably would have expected it to have been as energetic as it was or to be as exciting, but yeah, Gong Show is probably a fair statement. I think the conference itself probably was a little over its skis. The, doing it at the uh, Marriott Marquis is a pretty standard venue in New York to host any event for any sort of industry that's sort of not unique, but what was unique was just as you looked up, just the levels of just colour and everything going on, so much VC money just poured into that particular building and it was just a little bit too much. Most of the people that we know from the space weren't really in that venue. They were at all of the surrounding venues. Uh, and everything was sort of gated access. I think that was kind of the big difference is where the NFTs sort of gave us an inkling, heavily gaming, Polygon dominated the city. They co-funded so many different parties and events, which was really telling. But then the other thing is about this access and the, and the ticketing and societal elements of that which were incredible. So Punk's Breakfast, uh, the pier for Ape Fest and everything going on there. Um, Psychedelics Anonymous had a house. Um, Doodles did incredible events. Doodles, by the way, they did this at South by Southwest and they stood out because no one else did this quite well. The level of, mo like the money and the production levels that they had in there were incredible because the thing with Doodles was it wasn't as expensive as an NFT. You had kids walking around with their parents just engaging with all these things, which was just, it was very wholesome. It was less about, yeah, yeah, long lines, but it was really incredible in terms of just the level of access. And now Pharrell, obviously, Chief Creative Officer is a pretty big coup for them. But I think that was the thing that we saw there is a lot of people came to the fringes because it was New York, used the convenience. The fact that it's the only event that was taking place in New York this year around this space was kind of, interesting because New York is the best city to host an event of any of the cities because you've got capacity and staff. The one thing that was a really obvious tell in the US this year was no one has any staff. So good luck with your restaurants and your parties and TikToks of, TikTok had the party of South by Southwest and it was probably one of the worst parties because they had no staff. So you were waiting in lines for all their top tier clients waiting for hours just to get a drink. So like if TikTok can't make drinks happen, it's like, okay, where were we at? So I think New York is exciting because it, it, it just obviously is a city built for conferences, but uh, the Australian energy there was unbelievable. Like to see a lot of the Australian community go, and I know uh, Blockchain Australia, I know you were there with, you know, sort of driving force with a lot of this as well, but Steve sort of rallied a crew with the Blockchain Australia organisation and sort of took a bunch of people over there, but um, there was just incredible stories coming out of that. And so I, I know we saw some, Jake pointed up uh, this thing with Lyra, you know, Guys from Lyra were there, and Maple, and Synthetics, quite dominant, and you know we were there sort of with their Tracer brand, and uh, yeah, we had lot, lots of different people. Robbie and Mutable, and that whole team was over there dominating, as you normally see them do. And it was actually quite interesting because um, a lot of them have nothing to do with NFTs. Like Synthetics doesn't have any, anything to do with NFTs, but the presence was there, and. Um, for me, actually speaking of the Australian, I think um, Australian Open, so Tennis Australia guys, put on a lot of events. That was awesome, really represented. Um, I think uh, Ledger ran really great satellite events with their own curated panels, and Betty from Deadfellas was kind of, um, on one of the panels was their headliner, which was a really proud moment as well. So I think it was really great actually to see all the Aussie representation there that um that was good and i think the other thing you mentioned the other night when you spoke about this at uh, the web3 happy hours uh, a lot of corporate presence there as well do you want to talk a little bit about that yeah absolutely the uh well i mean southwest southwest is different because that's you know for the people who have been going there for years from the music industry to now, it's like the interactive part is heavily for the corporate dollars and we've seen that. Um, we, we saw that at a lot of the events. So like the partnerships and the corporatization of, of sort of what's happening in crypto is, is huge. I think one of the things that was really interesting for the NFT NYC in particular was Goldman Sachs held a global event in New York and flew in sort of all the crypto, uh, crypto aware and crypto curious people from around the world into New York to sort of just be exposed and then sort of meet in person and take advantage. And I think we saw a lot of that, a lot of satellite events. We uh, met and had a, uh, some good time with uh, the head of um, Crypto Visa, uh, head of the emerging markets, who was the uh, presidential nominee for Nigeria, one of the smartest people I've met in the space, who just has such an incredible vantage point of what crypto does and what Visa will do. And we've seen MasterCard sort of being in there. Raja was speaking at a, a couple of events sort of about what MasterCard's plans are. And I think that's really interesting in terms of legitimacy. Uh, and, and I think that's not going away, so. 
Cool. Thank you so much. I think that's it from us. I'll get back to Mark. Thank you, Jake Denny. Thank you, Leah and Jake. That was awesome. Good little wrap up. Um, we now have John, Soda Riders. Come on up. Quick, quick, quick. Five, four, three, two. You just made it. All right. So there's a bit of an announcement here from John. Um, just tell us when to flick through the screens and stuff. You've got five minutes. Thank you. I'll be done in four. I'm actually used to the 90 second pitches from last week, so I'll try and treat this as quick as possible. Uh, so I'd like to invite everyone in this room to NFT Sydney. We've got details regarding events on the next slide. But first, I'd like to thank uh, our brilliant sponsors or the people who have supported us from day one. Uh, not essential. The boys have shown up over there. So raise a beer. Thank you very much for showing up and just endless love and support. Uh, Crypto Sydney, uh, they're a group which is no longer really active, but they're willing to give us a huge shout out to their community. DJ and Aussie Apes, the boys aren't here, but they've got a killer podcast. I highly recommend everyone give them a listen. Uh, and of course, Cosmonauts, it's a killer NFT project, and a lot of those boys will be supporting us on the night as well. Obviously, a big thank you to Mark for giving me this five-minute segment, very last minute. Just had to email the slides across this morning, so really awesome guy. But yeah, it's basically going to be a rooftop party in Potts Point. It's going to be awesome, so that's similar to what you're going to expect on the night. It's a room full of DGENs, artists, and just everyone who matters in NFTs. So uh, the date, it's the 12th of August. It's a Friday, so if you're still working in Web2, you can bring your bag along and come along. Uh, there's not going to be any judgment from that. Uh, it starts at 6 p.m., so conveniently timed as well. Uh, it's the Sweetheart's Rooftop, so it's the top floor of the Potts Point Hotel. It's just a couple minutes' walk from the station. We're going to have a PO up there. We're going to be giving away NFTs as well. So if you don't own any, you're more than welcome to come along and get your first one. Uh, fingers crossed you win one. Um, and it's open for everyone. So if you don't know what crypto or NFTs are, you're more than welcome to come along. Uh, and yeah, just bring a friend along as well. So if you are involved, get someone on board. This is the best way to teach them through awesome events. Uh, so it's not going to be any sit down panels or any of that cool stuff. It is just going to be social drinks and yeah, having a good time. So on the next slide, I do have a QR code. Um, so yeah, if everyone wants to take their phones out now and scan it, I will be going around and naming and shaming people who don't. Um, and I have already, so I've actually announced this earlier today just to people informally, uh, and I've already got uh, close to 40 people signed up, which is insane. So tickets are limited, they are going fast as well. Uh, and if you did get a DM from me today, I sent it to a, like 100 people or so. So thanks for being on the inner circle. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's it for the registration. Now on the next slide, um, that's to get in touch with me. So that's my Twitter handle there. That's my brilliant Cosmonaut artwork. Uh, so feel free to scan me there. And that's me on LinkedIn. So if you're interested in getting involved, if you've got a project, if you want to sponsor or give an NFT away, uh, you're more than welcome to reach out to me and get in touch. But that's, I think that was less than five minutes, but thank you all for listening. And yeah, look forward to hanging out with you in a social setting. Now that is how you shill, well done. That's the proper way to do it. Can we get Ben up here? Collective shift. It's not a app for uh, people to do shift work, it is something else, and Ben's gonna tell us all about it. Thanks Mark, I wanna do a really quick shill as well. Um, so if you're like me that started crypto out and you've gone, what the fuck are these guys talking about? Um, it's, uh, it can be really daunting, firstly, getting into crypto. And here tonight, you're hearing all yield farm, DeFi, layer 1s, layer 2s, NFTs, gaming, metaverse, all this sort of stuff. And it can be really hard to actually wrap your head around. So um, what I did was I pulled together a really high quality team of, of analysts to deliver really simple educational material uh, for those getting started into crypto. So I founded this company uh, about two years ago, it's called Collective Shift. And really it's about helping on board the next wave of people into crypto. So we've got hundreds of free resources, a beginner's course, newsletter, YouTube content, um, a load of free stuff. So if you're sitting here just going, oh my God, this is too much, head over to Collective Shift. Um, we've got a bunch of free information that um, yeah, you can check out and, and hopefully can help you get into crypto and, and start investing safely. So I'm gonna wrap up there, that was really quick, but thank you everyone. Cheers, thanks for having me. Oh, really quick, last thing, sorry. We've also got David here. Uh, David is the founder of the new Australian Crypto Convention, one of the biggest conferences that's coming up in the Gold Coast. So Where is he? Up? Where he's up here. Give us a wave, David. He's so uh, go bundle him up. Um, that's in the Gold Coast in September. So uh, it's going to be a great event. Thanks. Thank you very much. I wanted to give a quick shout to the boys from Argamon who are at the back there, Elan and Jeremy. Hands up, boys. There they are. So um, coming to a cinema near you is Argamon, which will be Australia's top crypto 
trading platform, all sorts of amazing stuff. So I just wanted to give them a shout for coming down. Thank you. We'll get them along to chat through um, that platform uh, in coming episodes, but just wanted to acknowledge and thank you for coming down, boys. Um, POAP time, Marco. So if you love your free NFTs, then you're going to love these POAPs. Quite possibly the most attractive artwork. Uh, what move? You're such a bitch. Oh, the fucking hell. Uh, so don't don't get rugged. Get your power apps. Add to your collection. Uh, w we've done a deal with Woolworths. When you spend more than fifty bucks in Woolworths, you will now get an Oz D5 Pro, which is brilliant. So there's no plastic shit. There's no stickers or anything. Just go to the counter. Seamless wallet integration, powered by the team at Not Centralized. Absolutely superb. Um, that's how you do co-branding promotion, folks. So thank you, Mark. Off you go. Thank you, Nick. Uh, you need the Power App app? It's not, okay, oh, well, I'll have to. <laughs> Did we get rugged? Hang on. We didn't build the app. We didn't build the app. We didn't start the fire. It was always burning. <laughs> um, let's, I understand, let's go. There we go, try again, folks. Initially, when we did this, we, uh, we, we shared it online with the Google Meet, and some of the friendly folks that went to meet up um, that weren't really part of the crew shared the Pow app online, and they all ran out. So lesson learned, only in real life do you do Pow apps. So anyway, um, I wanted to say also uh, with uh, David up the back there, I think he's behind the glass, um, the Aussie Crypto Conference, which is on the Gold Coast in September. It's a weekend, 17th and 18th. We are having a panel. We're going to talk DeFi right before drinks, which is always our favorite time of the day to, to do DeFi talks and stuff, DeFi and drinks. But we are, thank you very much for, for coming in. And um, yeah, we, we're going to be up there. If you join our Discord, we are running a competition, which is still live because you guys can get a free ticket. You have to follow a few steps and stuff, but go on the Discord, join the Discord. Um, so, so the details are there. Um, finally, what was I going to say thank you for? Um, oh, yes, thank you. Uh, whenever I forget stuff, I look at Arturo's face of disappointment and I remember. <laughs> it's, it's Arturo and my mum, so I don't know what that means. Um, my psychiatrist will figure it out later. But he reminded me that a very important thing, so one of the hats that I do wear, apart from co-founding Oz DeFi Association, not centralized, which is um, Nick and Haturo and I, we've got this venture studio doing projects. One of the protocols, the projects we are building is called Trade Flows. It's built on the same tech, I'm wearing the shirt now. Uh, it's built on the same technology as Immutable, um, and that is Starknet. And Starknet is out of Starkware Labs, out of Israel, and they've agreed with us to start a layer two education series. We're starting here. It's going to be probably, it hasn't been locked in stone yet, but it's probably going to be August 30th. And that'll be an intro to Layer 2s and Stark where, StarkNet and um, you know what's being built on it. It's going to be a series, so each month, along with the Oz DeFi meetups, we're going to get into the coding and development. You do not have to be technical to get into this, okay? We'll probably encourage you to bring your laptop, install Python, do, do all the funky stuff. And, but if you've just got ideas, many people that are just in marketing or in sales or what, sorry, not just, I didn't mean it that way. I'm not that technical, so I'm, I'm bagging myself. But many people can get into the Web3 space. That's what we want to convey. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be technical. You have value in this space. So um, are the Power Apps working, by the way? Yes? Um, one more question before we wrap up and get to go to drinks. Um, how many people, put your hands up, how many people are already working, doing something or investing in Web3? Could you put your hands up? It's more than half the room, so that's good. When we've done this in Brisbane, when we've done it in uh, Melbourne, it's about 50-50, sometimes 60-40. That, that was a good number there. So my question on this is like, what bull market? Sorry, what bull market? What? <laughs> That's a good question. What bear market? <laughs> you know, people that are interested in building are doing well in this space. We know that, you know, this is the time for builders. Jake and I have spoken about that kind of stuff before. You've, th there's a good link on your LinkedIn. I can't remember when it was, but there was something there that you posted about, like, this is the time for people to build. So have great conversations now. We're going to go do some more networking while Chris and um, the rest of us pack up. Please do take your drinks with you. If you've got drinks here, cans or whatever, take it out. There's a rubbish bin over there. 
I forgot to do the amenities thing, it's behind, so come around this way for the toilets. People have figured it out because you're all very smart. And we are going to go to the Republic once we packed up and wrapped up. So if people want to stick around, continue the conversations, we will go drink. It, it is our sacrifice for you guys. We will go drink with you. So, so thank you very much. You guys are awesome. And thank you to the crowd online.